What I'll begin with is give you a brief overview of recent advances in the field of reflectance confocal microscopy of skin cancers. And after that, my good friend and colleague, Professor Charles DiMaggio from Northeastern, will touch upon some new work and some new results from his laboratory. And after that, my good friend and colleague from Lucid, Christian Costa, will give us all the real deal and give us a sound dose of reality. Uh, Christian is stepping in for Jay Eastman, who could not be here today. So Christian, thank you very much for being here at very short notice. I should point out that uh, I was actually with Northeastern for four years, working in Chuck's lab for about four years. And before that, I was at Lucid for five years. So I actually have a very strong connection to both Northeastern uh, as well as to Lucid, a connection that goes back many, many years. OK, so recent advances in the field have been in creating smaller and simpler and lower cost technology, both at Lucid as well as in our academic labs. Clinical studies focused on screening and diagnostics as well as imaging to guide surgery and image-guided biopsy of melanoma skin cancers and basal cell carcinomas. And the very latest and very new and truly exciting is machine learning based image analysis from Northeastern. This is classification algorithms for automated detection of morphology. Now I will very shortly touch upon all of these in some detail in the short time that I do have. But the point I want to make with this particular slide, the message is that to move from the laboratory into the market and then into the clinic requires a truly collaborative partnership. You know, basically, you need partners who are truly collaborative, truly synergistic, truly productive. And that's what we have between Northeastern, Lucid, and Sloan Kettering. Why do we care to image skin cancers? More importantly, why does the market, meaning the dermatologists, care about new technologies to detect skin cancers? Well, it turns out that among all the cancers that occur today, skin cancer has among the highest rates of incidence, not only in this country, but also now in many other parts of the world. Similar to the situation with breast cancer, skin cancer touches, no pun intended, almost all of us, either directly or indirectly, in one way or another. Every year, in this country alone, more than a million new cases are detected, for which more than five million biopsies are performed. So right, right off the bat, you can see that nearly 80% of these biopsies, meaning more than 4 million biopsies, turn out to show skin that's essentially normal or benign. Today, the US healthcare system is spending more than $2 billion a year just to find out that the skin that was taken from the patient was normal or benign, and therefore should not have been taken out in the first place. And that's only for skin cancer. Think about all the other cancers that one has to deal with. So the question, quite obviously, is can we come up with better ways to detect skin cancer? Could we do this directly on the patient non-invasively? Could we do this in real time, at low cost perhaps? Could we use an optical limiting technology such as confocal microscopy that offers resolution to see nuclear detail, which is the key feature that one looks for in, a, in pathology? Visual examination and dermoscopy are today routinely performed in the clinic. And these are right now the current standards of examination for skin on patients. A dermoscope is a low resolution, for me it's low resolution, 5 to 10 microns, low magnification microscope, as well as there are other methods based on spectroscopy, a few of which are also in the market. Now it turns out that with all of these methods, the sensitivity and the specificity tend to be variable and not really quite adequate for detecting skin precancers or cancers. None of these methods show, again, nuclear detail directly or cellular detail, which again are the key features that one looks for in pathology. However, the confocal microscope does in fact image this kind of detail quite nicely, both in skin as well as in other tissues, non-invasively and in real time. So in reflectance contrast, one can see, for example, dark nuclei. I've tried to show these here with these yellow arrows, these dark holes, if you will, that you see, uh, surrounded by bright and grainy appearing cellular cytoplasm. And these are images of normal skin, just as an example, uh, images of melanoma skin cancer from our clinical studies. <laughs> Two of my microscopes have progressed from the laboratory into the market and are now in, in being used in the clinic. Thanks very much to Jay Eastman and to the, gr the group at Lucid. One of these is for imaging skin cancers in vivo, and this is now a third generation handheld product called the Vivascope 3000 uh, that's being <laughs> tested and implemented in the clinic by dermatologists all around the world. 
The second is a benchtop mosaic microscope <coughs> for imaging and examining large areas of tissue from biopsies and skin excisions, with the idea that this technology will enable real-time or rapid pathology at the bedside so as to guide the surgery uh, in real time or as fast as possible to expedite the guidance of surgery. This is called the Viviscope uh, 2500. This slide will give you a sense of the time it takes from when one first starts building something on a bench <coughs> and goes through the cycle of failures and, and, and wrong turns to when one's instrument or one's technology may be expected to be implemented and tested and used routinely in the clinic. A timeline that in our case was about 15 years for the in vivo imaging microscope and a timeline that was a little bit shorter, I'd say about 10 to 12 years with the benchtop mosaicing microscope, shorter because we'd gone up the learning curve and so we had the benefits of experience with our first uh, instrument. This timeline includes essentially bench work, as one can imagine, that's the starting point of all our projects. Uh, phase one studies or transmission studies to test initial feasibility, followed by building commercial products, typically one or two or three stages of commercialization, followed by phase two studies to determine initial measures of sensitivity and specificity before we head into clinical trials. Now with the benchtop mosaic microscope, we are not into trials yet, but we expect to get there uh, sometime in the near future. Clinical trials with the in vivo imaging microscope are now progressing quite nicely, with Lucid having placed the microscope in the hands of leading dermatologists all over the world. And the microscope and the technology is showing promise and is showing success for detecting melanoma <coughs> in vivo with a sensitivity and specificity that is superior to that of dermoscopy. These are essentially from published studies that are listed at the bottom. Detecting basal cell carcinomas in vivo, again with very high sensitivity and specificity, that makes it clinically relevant and useful to the clinicians. Mapping of melanomas to guide surgery. This is to determine subsurface cancer margins, and we've shown success in 27 cases of large and complex what are known as lentigomaligna melanomas and amelanotic melanomas. These are essentially melanomas that occur mostly below the surface. And so trying to map the margins to guide excision is a key application area and a key problem that needs to be solved in the clinic. Mapping or mosaicing of basal cell carcinomas in skin excision from most surgery with the idea that this kind of mapping or mosaicing can provide a means to do rapid pathology at the bedside and such techniques can result in powerful adjuncts for today's methods of histology, uh, which tend to be labor intensive and slow. Mapping or imaging of residual squamous and basal cell carcinomas in shave biopsy wounds on patients in situ. Uh, this was a study that was completed recently and is about to be published. And the results demonstrate the possibility for doing intraoperative imaging of tumors that are left behind after excisions, so as to guide the surgery in real time and to come up with better outcomes for surgical exigence. We are also exploring line scanning as a possible approach towards smaller, simpler, lower cost technology with the obvious idea that one can begin to accelerate dissemination around the world into diverse clinics and markets. And this is a project that I began during my final years with Lucid as a transition to Northeastern. And this has been a very good collaboration between Northeastern and Memorial Sloan Kettering, starting with a lot of bench work that was done when I was here and we've since then built a clinical prototype that's about to enter uh, testing on for skin cancers. And the very latest and very exciting is machine learning based <coughs> classification algorithms towards automated detection of morphology. Now, such algorithms can act as tools to help the clinicians begin to read the images in a manner similar to the reading of pathology, as well as be an aid for screening <coughs> and diagnosis. And eventually, I think in the long run, such Algorithms can be tools for education and training. So in an initial project, we've shown that we can localize the domain epidermal junction in stacks of confocal images with a classification accuracy of about 90% and localization accuracy of 15 microns. So very promising results as we move forward with such algorithms and models. We also built an atlas of reflectance confocal microscopy, and this too was a team-based effort involving groups from all over the world who essentially wrote chapters, and this will now be a tool for education and training. 
So as we continue to advance into the market and into the clinic, there are a host of challenges and opportunities that we face. And I won't go through these. I'm just setting the stage here for Christian to talk about these in some detail. But we have, but we have opportunities and challenges which are essentially clinical in nature as well as technological in nature, as one can imagine. In fact, we are more on the clinical side compared to the technology side. And so what I'll do now is, is stop talking and let Chuck touch upon one of these, which is to look for, for, for contrast agents for detecting uh, melanoma. This is uh, some new, uh, new developments in our research laboratory that, have, uh, that are just in the process of being reported for the very first time. Um, and uh, the search for uh, the ability to image and uh, visualize melanin in the uh, skin add to the morphological detail that uh, we can get with the confocal microscope. Uh, probably uh, most people are familiar with the uh, conventional uh, fluorescence uh, images. You excite uh, material with, uh, say, ultraviolet light and uh, it uh, decays to a metastable state and then emits, uh, for example, in the visible spectrum. Uh, you can also uh, excite uh, melanin with an infrared uh, photon and have it emit even longer wavelength uh, infrared photon. And that's what we were originally searching for. Uh, in the process, uh, we discovered a uh, three photon uh, excited fluorescence process that uh, looks like the middle picture here. Um, in a three photon process, three photons are absorbed uh, and uh, a shorter wavelength photon is emitted. Uh, you can describe the process in terms of virtual states that have uh, lifetimes that are typically in the uh, femtoseconds. Uh, <clears throat> however, um, and, and to do and to excite these, you need a, a very short pulse, uh, high-powered laser. Uh, we found, as we were looking at this three-photon process, that we could also see it with a CW laser. And the reason for that is that it is, in fact, a stepwise process in which um, how do I back up here? Uh, the um, the intermediate states are real states. The absorption spectrum of melanin is, uh, is very uh, broad and uh, there's a, uh, a wealth of uh, real intermediate states. And so we can stepwise excite one state and then the next and then the third state and then have our fluorescence from there. Uh, these states have lifetimes that might be in the nanoseconds and so we have a, a tremendous advantage in the fluorescence cross-section and uh, therefore we can do this with uh, CW laser. Uh, the picture down below on the left is uh, sepia melanin uh, granules. These are uh, basically the, uh, the dark ingredient in uh, squid ink which is used as the standard for melanin. Here are some examples of the images. Uh, we have, uh, we say green here in quotes because it's, uh, the, uh, the color is actually yellow. This is a false color image. Uh, the, uh, the green in this picture shows the three photon fluorescence uh, image. The um, red shows the single photon uh, blue excited uh, fluorescence. And uh, you can see that there's a, there's a general overlapping of these two. There are some places where one mode is excited, some places where the other is excited, and then some places where there's, uh, there's been some photo bleaching and neither one is excited. This is the control uh, sepia melanin. Uh, we also imaged a black hair and we see the same general features in the, uh, in the black hair. 